you're a woman, you are three times more likely to be diagnosed with depression or anxiety than a man. And if you look at that statistic in isolation, or you're the sort of person that writes clickbait for the Daily Mail, you could see that statistic and you could declare that depression and anxiety are female illnesses because we're women and we're terribly emotional and we're drama queens and therefore it doesn't really exist. Sarah Vine, ladies and gentlemen. Um, however, if you zoom out from that statistic and look at the statistics of drug and alcohol addiction, if you're a man, you're three times more likely to need help for drug and alcohol addiction. You're also far more likely to take your own life. Three in four suicides in this country are male. So what that tells us is that women are seeking help for the symptoms of low mood and emotional distress. Men are self-medicating. They're trying to distract themselves. And in many cases, they're reaching crisis point. When we had this revelation for Mental Health Week in May last year, we called in some favors. All three of us in the self-esteem team have um, sort of, I, I say day jobs, it's not really day jobs, it's sort of supplementary jobs in, in the media. So I, I write for The Guardian and um, pop up on Sky News as their token lefty. And so we called in some favours from some high profile men that we knew and we made a video called Switch on the Light. You can find it on YouTube and it's got Stephen Fry in it, Clark Carlisle, who's a footballer, Professor Green, these kind of icons of masculinity, you know, rapper, sports person, um, James Black Glody, who is um, the uh, front man of a rock band. Icons of masculinity. And what we asked them to do was to say just something that worried them. 10 seconds on their iPhone, tell us something that worries you. And we knitted it together into a, a short video to show that emotions don't emasculate, that you can be an icon of masculinity and still have worries, still have feelings. We put it on YouTube. Within its first two days of being on YouTube, this video received 30,000 hits. We're a teeny tiny campaign group of three. We don't have a PR department. So we thought, clearly this has touched people. This has resonated with people. Around the same time, I saw a speech by our then Prime Minister, David Cameron, and he was talking about um, a 1.4 billion pound investment that was being put into young people's mental health. Remember when we all thought that that was true and might happen. He was talking about that. Um, and he was talking about the, the types of people who might benefit from that investment. And he talked specifically about teenagers with eating disorders and reducing the waiting time for them. And he spent a long time talking about new mums who might be at risk of post postnatal depression. And you know, it goes without saying, you want those people to get the help that they need and that they deserve. But I'm sitting there watching this speech and I'm thinking, you are prime minister of a country where suicide is the biggest killer of men under 50. Between the ages of 24 and 35, one in four male deaths is a suicide. Where are the men in this conversation? They were notably absent. And I came to the conclusion that that was for two reasons. Firstly, because this is not a nice thing to talk about. People don't like to talk about people killing themselves. And that in itself is a problem. There's no evidence to suggest that talking about suicide responsibly and in the right way encourages people to do it. There's a lot of evidence to show that talking about suicide responsibly stops people from taking their own lives. But secondly, and perhaps more pertinently, uh, we live in a, 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 an era where uh, feminism is very much on the agenda, and that's brilliant and glorious in so many ways. However, we've started to think of men as uh, not women. You know, like, <laughs> we don't think of them as being a gender in their own right. And if you don't think of a demographic as being a gender in their own right, it's very difficult to think of them as having specific needs. So men were just being ignored in this mental health conversation. We managed to find a very small team of three at UCL who are specifically looking into male mental health. Because if mental health is the Cinderella service of health, male mental health is the Cinderella service of mental health. But they, their argument was that you know, if, if men and women instinctually respond differently to emotional distress, it stands to reason that we need different solutions. We need some kind of tailored intervention. So we hooked up with them and looked at the research that they were doing around shame triggers. 
The number one psychological shame trigger for women is body image. If you want to shame a woman, you call her ugly. The number one psychological shame trigger for men is strength. If you want to shame a man, you call him weak. And that relates back to my very first point about critical thinking. If you think about all the times that shame trigger is being pressed in young people. So what they said to us is you need to redefine what strength is. Where mental health interventions are getting it wrong for young men is they're saying it's okay to be vulnerable. You don't have to be strong all the time. It won't resonate. What you need to do is say it's strong to talk about how you feel. It's strong to seek help when you're struggling. So we've been trying this in schools. We've been going out into schools and, and working with young men and trying to get them talking in a way that feels masculine to them. So all the focus groups that we did, these teenage boys were saying to us, sometimes I want to talk about how I feel, but then when I do it, it makes me feel girly, and that's really uncomfortable feeling for me. So I want to do this in a masculine way, and I want role models. I want men to show me how you might do, do this, how you might have a conversation about how you feel in a masculine way. And that's where the focus of our work in schools is taking us at the moment. But if you're going to encourage young people to talk about how they feel, then you've got to provide a safety net for the people who are on the receiving end of that conversation. And that's where mental health first aid comes in. I don't know if you've heard of an organization called Mental Health First Aid England. Um, I know that Norman Lamb was recently given mental health first aid training. I'm a mental health first aid instructor, um, which means that I can teach you how to do it if you would like me to. Um, but if you are a mental health first aider, you essentially only have two jobs. You know, if I fainted on the floor right now, and you all, one of you came to the front and checked that I was breathing, and put me in the recovery position, and phoned an ambulance, you're a physical first aider. If I come to you and I say to you, I can't see the point of anything, I just feel completely hopeless. Your response is going to have a direct impact on my mental health. So you become a mental health first aider. As a mental health first aider, you've only really got two jobs. Your first job is to listen without judgment, which is really hard to do because you want to fix it for them. You want to tell them what they should do. You want to ask them why, why, why are you self-harming? But that's judgmental. So you need to ask them open questions. What does that feel like for you? Tell me more about that. Get them talking, get, get, establish trust, get them opening up. And then your next job is to point them in the direction of where they can get further help, support and advice, which is incredibly difficult to do, what with support and advice being the way it is at the moment. But, you know, for example, at the self-esteem team, we've created a page on our website which is responsible charities that give good advice on mental health, because there's a lot of stuff on the internet which isn't. Um, so let's look at this website together. Um, I'll help you make an appointment with your GP. I'll help you make an appointment with your school counsellor. I really think you, you know, if you're a young person, I really think you need to talk to your mum or dad about this. You point them in the direction of where they can get further advice and support, and then your job is done. This is what we're trying to emphasise to young people, because what I'm seeing more than anything are what I call epidemics of concern. You've got one person within a friendship group who has a mental health problem and their friends are so worried about them, they want to fix it for them so badly that it's started to impact their mental health, their ability to function, their happiness. And the buck cannot end with young people. It also can't end with teachers, incidentally. It needs to end with appropriate, qualified medical or therapeutic support. <coughs> Which brings me on to my last point. You can't point people in the direction of further help and care if it doesn't exist. And whilst I'm no longer a government advisor, I am still a writer, I am still a campaigner, I am still on telly, I do still write for the papers. So I will always use my voice to stand up for young people, for parents and teachers, the people who are supporting them. And I wanna invite you all today to support me in doing that. You know, one of the things that I was saying as mental health champion was that this regime of testing, testing from earlier and earlier, and testing more and more rigorously, probably not good for mental health. There were riots about that. There were parents protesting outside school gates. Teachers were writing articles about that. There was a strike. And then just last week, Justin Greening's gone, okay, we'll rethink that. So our voices do make a difference. I know it feels like an insurmountable battle sometimes, 
And when you're on your own, when you're isolated, it, you know, it is. But together, we're really strong. So anything that I can do to be your representative, to use my voice for good, please do let me know. And thank you so much for listening.